Good morning. This hearing is called to order, although you've been very orderly. So um, again, good morning. I want to thank you all for being here. My name is Council Member Debbie Rose, and I am the chair of the Committee on Youth Services. Today, we are conducting an oversight hearing on DYCD's Adult Literacy Program. In addition to oversight, we will also hear a bill intro 649 by Council Member Eugene, which would incorporate bilingual components into DYCD's after school programs. I would first like to thank our speaker, Corey Johnson, who is always committed to the increasing the quality of life for people in New York City and his commitment to youth in, in New York. I would also like to thank all of the young people, literacy advocates, program providers, and all of those who came to testify at this important hearing. Finally, I would like to acknowledge my colleagues who have joined us, council member, who is our new council member, council member Farrah Lewis. Thank you, this is her first committee hearing and thank you for being here. And um, we will be joined by others, I'm sure. Each September 8th, since 1966, the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization, also known as UNESCO, raises international awareness about adult and child literacy through the observance of International Literacy Day. It seems fitting that that theme of International Literacy Day this year was literacy and multilingualism. UNESCO recognizes that literacy is an important international matter of dignity and human rights that helps to sustain communities, uplift the impoverished, and provide opportunities for persons around the globe. Indeed, Frederick Douglass, a former slave and famous abolitionist, was quoted as saying, once you learn to read, you will forever be free. This quote means a lot as we have seen that literacy and education are mechanisms to succeed and rise through the economic, social, and political ranks of society. But throughout history, literacy has also been a method of social control and oppression, oppression, as the ability to read and write have determined where certain people stand within the societal hierarchy. Literacy has been seen as a way to keep the poor powerless and the rich powerful. However, from this quote, we see that literacy could lead also to a better future as it once did for Frederick Douglass. Low literacy levels are an important issue that exists within the United States. Particularly important is low adult literacy rates, uh, levels, as more than 36 million adults cannot read or write above a third grade level in New York State alone, there are a total of 3.4 million residents who are either functionally illiterate, lack a high school diploma, or cannot speak English. Even more shocking is that only 10% of those who have low literacy levels are receiving the help they need. Low adult literacy rates are common aspects of poverty, incarceration, high school dropout rates in schools, and a barrier to understanding basic health, financial, and consumer issues. It has been reported that children with parents with low literacy levels are more likely to get poor grades, display behavioral problems, have high absentee rates, repeat school years, or even drop out. In addition, the economic impacts of low adult literacy levels are extreme. With an estimated $225 billion or more each year nationwide being wasted due to non productivity in the workforce, crimes, and loss of tax revenue due to unemployment, and another $232 billion a year in health care costs. In an effort to ensure that adults receive help in improving their literacy skills, DYCD supports programming and services related to reading, writing, and test assessing secondary completion, or TASC, which is now the new, the replacement for the GED. 
which has since replaced the General Educational Development, or GED, test. And English language classes for youth and adults within New York City. Particularly important to this hearing is DYCD's adult literacy program, which connects anyone over the age of 16 who is not enrolled or required to be enrolled in school or who is unable to adequately speak, read, or write the English language with a range of programs. Programs include adult basic education to teach reading, writing, and math to native or fluent English speakers, task prep to prepare students for the required test to receive a high school equivalency diploma, and English for speakers of other languages classes to improve English language skills for those who lack fluent, lang not fluent knowledge of the English language. Ultimately, these DYCD funded programs look to ensure New Yorkers learn the reading, writing, and communication skills they need to obtain a job and or continue their education. Today, we will look to better understand DYCD's adult literacy program, what gaps exist, and how programming can be improved. In addition to the oversight portion of this hearing, we will also hear intro number 649, which is sponsored by Council Member Matthew Eugene and would require bilingual DYC after school programs at schools with more than one third of the students in the school district being English language learners. The law would require that such schools have certain bilingual components, including things such as bilingual instructors and staff, as well as activities conducted in native languages in the native languages of the students. As New York City is a diverse melting pot of races, ethnicities, and religions, this legislation would be appropriate in an effort to ensure that children who do not speak English receive comprehensive after-school programming just like any other child. I look forward to hearing from those invited to testify and would like to thank my staff, Issa Rogers um, and Venori, and the committee staff, Paul Senegal, Kevin Katowski, and Michelle Peregrine, along with our community engagement representative, Elizabeth Arts. And now, Paul, we will swear in our, our panel. Good morning. Would you raise your right hands? Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony today, and to respond honestly to council members' questions? Please state your names for the record. I'm Sandra Gutierrez from DYCD. I'm Ron Zhang, DYCD. Susan Haskell, DYCD. Wanda Asheril, DYCD. Thank you all. You can begin um, your testimony. Good morning, Chair Rose and members of the Youth Services Committee. I'm Sandra Gutierrez from the Deputy Commissioner for Community Development at the Department of Youth and Community Development. I'm pleased to be joined by Susan Haskell, Deputy Commissioner for Youth Services, Assistant Commissioner Wanda Ashraw, and Assistant Commissioner Rong Zhang. On behalf of Bill Chung, we thank you for the opportunity to comment on DYCD's Adult Literacy Services and Intro 649, which would require bilingual instruction to after-school programs in, in certain school districts. I will testify on adult literacy and Deputy Commissioner Haskell will then discuss the bill. These topics really speak to DYCD's mission to invest in a network of community-based organizations and programs to alleviate the effects of poverty and to provide opportunities for New Yorkers and communities to flourish. The ability to read and write is fundamental to a person's capacity to succeed. English proficiency is associated with the ability to find and keep employment that, keeps, that, pay, that pays a, a living wage and provides opportunities for upward advancement. 
helps parents fully support and participate in their child's education and to actively engage in civic life. According to the 2015 American Community Survey, 1.8 million individuals or 23% of New York City of the New York City population are not proficient in English and 1.1 or 19% of the 19 of the city's population 25 and over have less than a high school education. We want to thank the council for its strong and long-standing partnership on adult literacy programs. It has been critical funding to programs across the city. DYCD commits 13.87 million to support adult literacy programs from a mix of CSBG, CDBG, and city tax levy funding. This work is complemented by other literacy programs supported by the Department of Education, the City University of New York, and the public library systems. DYCD's adult literacy programs include a variety of courses that meet the various needs of our participants. For example, these adult literacy programs offer adult basic education that teaches both native and non-native English speakers reading, writing, and math. We offer testing assessment, secondary completion, and English for speakers of other languages. These teach listening, speaking, reading, and writing to individuals whose primary language is not English. We appreciate the work of the literacy providers who are at the front line committed to serving immigrant communities who are constantly threatened by ICE raids, family separation, and the new public charge rule. We also want to acknowledge the work of the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs. We have been working closely with them on advising programs on the impact of the latest actions in Washington. Fortunately, Families that participate in DYCD program services will not be impacted by the changes in the public charge rule. Our efforts, in our efforts to support funded programs to make continuous improvement, DYCD in collaboration with the technical assistance provider, the Literacy Center, provides professional development and technical assistance to literacy providers. Staff development focuses on building best practices in literacy, numeracy, English language instruction, and curriculum development. Last year, over 40 training and coaching sessions were provided to approximately 400 literacy staff. In fiscal year 19, our literacy programs enrolled over 16,000 participants. While the majority of program participants made progress in literacy, over 56% of the enrolled participants improved their reading skills in at least one grade level. Students not only benefit academically, but participating in our, by participating in our literacy programs, they also receive other much needed assistance, such as referrals to employment training, college assistance, and individual support. Before I turn it over to Deputy Commissioner Haskell, I'd like to share a story uh, about a student in one of our programs to demonstrate the value of our programs. The student was incarcerated at 16 and became pregnant at 17 years old, but she got a second chance by enrolling in our programs. Here's what she wrote about the program. It's a calm, supportive environment. The teachers and the workers treat me with respect. They are supporting, understanding, and care about my education. On the days I couldn't attend, the teachers called with deep concern. They taught me what, did it, what to say at job interviews and even provided me with interview clothes. The program is important to me because it gave me a second chance at success. It has bestowed a purpose in my life, given me a chance to make my parents proud, and more importantly, to be the best I can be for my daughter. This is just one of the thousand examples that, uh, of the extraordinary work our programs do to help students. Now it's my pleasure to give it over to Deputy Commissioner. 
DYCD supports the delivery of after-school services for young people with a range of language skills in a manner that's linguistically and culturally accessible. There are many benefits for young people to participate in our programs, including development of positive self-esteem, fostering positive peer connections and caring relationships between youth and staff, engagement of parents in the development of their children and exposure to different languages and cultures within a community that can instill an appreciation for diversity. Our program participants speak many languages in addition to English. Even so, 97% of our participants, the vast majority, report that they speak English well. In fiscal year 2019, of the 180,000 after-school participants age 18 and under, roughly 22,000 plus, or 13%, indicated English was not their primary language. But the majority of these students also reported that they were able to speak English well or better. Roughly 5,500 of the participants, or 3%, indicated that they didn't speak English well at all, or at all. Our partnerships with community-based providers are essential to our successful programs. Our funding model reflects that community-based organizations and their staff are best equipped to meet the needs of English language learners. A key role of DYCD's partners in after school for non-English speaking youth is to help them adapt to their community and become contributing members in their neighborhood. As a youth development environment, after school can play a vital role in the process of learning language and culture in a new setting. The organizations we fund are expected to hire staff and design programs in accordance with the needs of their participants. Successful program elements for English language learners include hiring staff from the neighborhood, including those who speak the languages of participants, providing essential written materials in languages spoken by their communities, provide program activities which engage all the senses to develop language skills, having students engage with peers, making social connections that will support language development in a supportive setting, using play, arts, literacy, and STEM activities, for example, to reinforce youth development principles regardless of language ability, and programs working closely with their school, which may have additional language resources, including a language service uh, for parent meetings and orientations. Here are just a few examples of after-school programs and their approach to supporting English language learners. Uh, in Chair Rose's district at PS57, the YMCA serves a Liberian community in Park Hill. A main focus for the program there is having staff on site that speak multiple dialects of the African community and Spanish, Arabic, and Urdu to help parents and youth who need assistance. The program translates important written materials for parents to help keep them engaged in their child's experience in after school. And additionally, the program partnership with the school includes having after school staff present for day school family events. In Council Member Eugene's district, Canva operates a sonic program at MS 246 Walt Whitman. The program serves a predominantly Caribbean population and some staff speak Haitian Creole and are able to translate when students and parents need assistance. In partnership with KSIM, they offer steel pan classes. They hosted a family night with a Caribbean carnival theme where staff and students dressed in attire to represent Caribbean countries and a cultural dinner was served. The theme carried over into the community school event that took place the next day. In Northern Brooklyn at St. Nick's Alliance, about 26% of youth enrolled in their programs, they have five programs, are English language learners, St. Nick's developed a multi-tiered literacy immersion model. Their program enables young people to explore learning through visual performing and digital arts. They celebrated the culture, they celebrate the culture of language, excuse me, they celebrate the culture and language of origin of participants through a partnership with New York City Children's Theater and Magic Box Productions, which specialize in teaching English language learners. St. Nick's also operates a mobile library with 15,000 title collection in English and non-English languages and offers reading coaches for one-on-one -on -one and small group instruction, as well as transformational coaching to help English language learners with behavioral challenges. New York Edge operates at the Academy for New Americans, a school in Astoria that provides after-school services to young people who recently arrived in the country and are still learning English. Youth study at the academy and then transfer to their neighborhood middle school or traditional high school when their English language has improved. 
Children in this program come from 38 countries and speak 18 <coughs> languages. Staff members serve as interpreters in Spanish, Arabic, Bengali, Chinese, French, Hindi, Urdu, Russian, and Greek, for example. In addition to the recruitment efforts of our providers, families can learn where services are available through DYCD's centralized resources. For example, we operate Youth Connect, a 1-800 hotline. Callers can learn about our programs and find sites in their neighborhood. When callers need interpretation assistance, we connect them to our language bank operators who have the ability to speak up to 180 different languages. We also are very excited that um, just in the past week or so, we launched Discover DYCD 2.0. This is a new public access website which will allow New Yorkers to find DYCD resources throughout the city, and it's also available in over 180 languages. Discover DYCD includes a feature which allows them to apply to many DYCD services at one time online. To reach out more directly to immigrant communities, DYCD advertises uh, services in community newspapers in, in multiple languages, including in Haitian Creole, Russian, Spanish, <coughs> Urdu, um, Bengali, and Polish. To help us meet the needs of uh, all New Yorkers, we're currently conducting a community needs assessment across the city in 10 specified languages under the city's language access law, plus Yiddish. The data will be used to inform DYCD strategic planning and new directions for the agency. Through hundreds of after-school programs, including the examples described above, DYCD is well positioned to meet the needs of young people and families. We appreciate the spirit of the bill and look forward to continued discussions with the council on promoting services for English language learners. Uh, once again, thank you for holding the hearing today. We look forward to collaborating with you <coughs> on how to best support literacy and after-school programs. Thank you so much for your testimony this morning. Um, and we've been, oh, I was, hmm? he's coming back. <laughs> we've, been joined, we've been joined by Council Member Eugene. Um, I'm sure he'll be back. Um, so, we all, um, as, as was well stated in your, in your presentation and in my opening remarks, um, the importance of literacy and um, the value and uh, what the negative impacts are, you know, in the absence of it. So uh, today we're trying to uh, see just how, where we are in terms of um, our literacy services and, um, and to talk about Council Member Eugene's bill. So um, there are multiple definitions for literacy. Um, which one or how does DYCD um, define literacy and um, does that definition drive your programming? I'm gonna let Ron. <laughs> Well, um, yes, I agree with you. There are various definitions. Um, but here we basically are using the definition that was uh, used in the National Survey of Adult, uh, adult Needs, basically is you know, a person's ability to uh, use English uh, you know, to be able to function and to be able to read, understand, and process documents. Okay, and um, and so um, does that definition drive the the pro, um, the programs that you sure. have developed? Sure. Mm -hmm. So you know programs are all designed to teach people basic reading, writing, and uh, numeracy skills mm -hmm. to enable people to understand uh, basic English and be able to function uh, at the at the at the level that's you know needed for them to uh, survive in terms of English language learners mm -hmm. and for uh, people who are in our high school equivalency programs to be able to conduct job interviews. Mm -hmm. And also there is a functional level too. You know, um, the materials that we use, for example, are most, you know, classrooms are mostly contextualized with authentic materials so that people can learn not only the language but also the basic vocabulary, 
that that's going to be used situationally. For example, if you go to a doctor's office, you know, what are the basic words to use? If you go to a job interview, you know, how are you going to conduct yourself in terms of the language and also the, you know, the, the verbal and nonverbal aspect of the, of the uh, interview. Um, so, you know, it's, it's really um, literacy skills, numeracy skills, plus anything that's meaningful to people's real life. Was the curriculum developed by DYCD and is it standardized? Uh, no, uh, we do not use a standardized curriculum and uh, as a lot of providers, you know, so this has been an ongoing discussion with the providers. Um, people generally feel that we should not have a uniform uh, curriculum and it, simply because programs are from, you know, people, pe 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 programs serve people from different backgrounds with different needs, you know. Um, so programs develop their own curriculum, develop their own lesson plans. However, we convene them to share the curriculum and lesson plans, how they conduct their lessons. And we work closely with our partner, the Literacy Assistance Center, uh, you know, to provide professional development in terms of developing curriculum and lesson plans uh, that are in terms of the uh, curriculum uh, style, how you use it, and that's, that's standardized. For example, we created a, what we call a, you know, a nine strand, strand curriculum. And you're gonna, in our curriculum, you identify the needs of the students, you identify the appropriate materials to be used, you incorporate a uh, evaluation uh, piece into the curriculum. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's standardized, but in terms of the content, it's not. That's great. So you provide a rubric for them, and within yes. that framework, they have the ability to do what meets the needs of their particular um, exactly. constituency. Exactly. Okay. Um, how many adults are illiterate in New York City? And, um, and of that number, how many or what percentage would you say are receiving literacy services? Well, um, based on what we generally know, you know as, um, in, as indicated in the testimony, there are about 1.8 million people that you know, either do not speak English well or do not have a high school diploma. So we consider those people that are, you know, that are in need of literacy services. Um, DYCD, um, thanks to last few years, thanks to support of the council, last few years we had expanded our services. Mm -hmm. So we are able to serve about uh, 16,000 people annually just within DYCD, and as you know that DYCD is not the only literacy providing agency, and uh, there is CUNY, Department of Education, and the library systems also provide services, and funding could come from the city, could also come from the state education department, and there's also private funding supporting the services. So is that 16,000 um, number uh, your capacity, or if that's, or do you have the ability to serve more? Well, you know, uh, we are always in the business of, you know, building capacity, expand services. We know that, you know, the number of people we serve is, is, uh, is far from, you know, uh, the, 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 the needs out there. Um, we always try to build that capacity and uh, try to serve more. Yes, definitely programs can serve more if there is continued stable funding. Do you um, feel that you have the capacity to meet the need? The um, needs that you know, that we will need, uh, you know, a lot of study. But I'm pretty sure that we, our programs, you know, can serve more. I want to add to that that. Uh, uh, a couple of years ago when we started to, when we, we, when the expansion started, we wanted to make sure 
not only that we could meet capacity, but that the capacity was met with quality services. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that we knew was that there was uneven uh, capacity out in the community. So some uh, community-based organizations had a lot of capacity and, and did quality programs, and then some others had mm -hmm. great interaction and, and they had great relationships with the community, but maybe they needed more support in terms of staff development or professional development. And so we um, put together a plan uh, during the first expansion that had to do with how do we drive uh, staff development to build capacity? Not just capacity in terms of instruction, but all the supporting uh, programs around uh, the literacy program. So um, th that's how we partnered with the Literacy Center and they do a lot of our professional development. We can talk a little bit about that. But also there are other ways that we build capacity in the field and that is exchanging those best practices, right? Um, having networks of uh, providers who come together and talk about what works, what doesn't work, what needs to be tweaked. Um, how often should this happen? How do you accelerate learning? All those kinds of questions that uh, that community needs to have to constantly improve services with a certain amount of funding that hasn't changed, right? Or that doesn't change. So uh, we, we have focused a lot in the place where we, we thought we needed to focus was on that capacity building piece so that students could get better quality services from the, the, um, the cadre of instructors. One of the things that we also knew was that, is, that uh, training to be an instructor was very expensive. So how, if people wanted to be literacy providers or instructors, it would take them a, not only a long time, but it would cost them. So this, uh, this strategy really was to identify the people who really wanted to do that, who were already doing that, and who needed to get better so that we can amplify not just the field, but raise the quality of services for those programs. So Commissioner, and uh, along with that line, um, do you provide any services to the service providers to help them um, be able to meet the need, you know, uh, after you've, you've had this cross-pollination with other um, agencies to determine, like, what are best practices, um, do you then provide technical assistance to, you know, the, the, uh, the, to the programs at DYCD? Absolutely. So there's several layers to this, and one is that the literacy assistant, uh, the literacy center, uh, does that formal training for those instructors, right? But then there are other strategies that we use um, so that those uh, shared practices also can be uh, documented and, and they could be shared. But Ron could talk a little bit more about. Um, how we do that. Sure, that was a good question. You know. Um, Providers, you know, work with us and, uh, you know, teachers, a lot of teachers are part-time, uh, very limited time to actually, you know, to seek professional development. So what we have done is that one, with DYCD funded the Literacy Assistance Center to be our technical assistance provider. Um, then within DYCD staff, we have staff that are specifically trained in each of the areas that we fund namely English as a second language, ABE, and HSE. Okay. And we provide workshops on a constant basis. Um, these workshops are all developed and designed based on a needs assessment at the beginning of each year. And then they are developed into, you could be one-shot workshops, could be serious workshops, institutes, and also uh, co-teaching, coaching, so all sorts of things, and also we build resources for, for people, for example, at AC, uh, build a, a website where resources are there for people to, to access. So there are all different ways, and it's really a multiple problem, pr approach to the staff development. In a, on top of that, you know, we encourage programs to 
share best practices. We convene them to do networking, to find out you know, about each other's services and needs, and, and uh, then you know, to, to do the sharing. So every year we convene um, what we call teacher share. Okay. You know, so basically all teachers question. come in and mm -hmm. share the best practices, mm -hmm. and uh, then they go back and t test and experiment with little techniques that they learn from the, from the, the, uh, from the uh, sessions. Uh, we also started last year uh, what we call a literacy conference day, literacy staff development day. So each year there is one day we devoted to staff development where we, you know, have panel discussions. We have, you know, 10 to 15 workshops developed for each specific area. And there we not only have DYCD funded programs there, uh, literacy assistant staff is there, and staff from CUNY is there, so they're all there sharing the best practices. Thank you. Um, uh, I'm sure you you have a demographic breakdown of uh, the, those individuals who require literacy services by age, sex, race, and ethnicity, and um, and where are they, uh, I guess, geographic location where they primarily come from. Um, is that something you can get, make available to us? We can make uh, uh, information, uh, our demographic information available to you, yes. So let me say something about demographics. Um, we, at DYCD, we uh, collect demographic information so that we can uh, improve programs so that we know where uh, people are accessing services, but we also know where the gaps are. Um, so we do collect uh, demographic information that's basic, name, age, uh, address, those kinds of things. But we also ask other questions that have to do with identifying the needs of the participants. It could be, do you have health care? Um, other, other questions like that so that when a person applies, um, they, uh, we can connect them to other services. Um, if you've heard the commission, Commissioner Chong speak about our integrated approach to the work that we do at DYCD and certainly moving forward on connecting programs through not just referrals but best practices and capacity building, we're doing uh, some of that work where uh, you know, the demographic information is really important for us to use as guides or to or to develop new programs if, if need be. But we're, we're ha we'll be happy to share some of that demographic information if you'd like. So you, you refer them to wraparound services that are within um, DYCD's purview or even outside of that? Cor correct. Right. Okay. And we do that, I think uh, Deputy Commissioner Haskell did talk about uh, our new uh, online system, which is a, a an online application, universal application that it has just launched last week. Of course, we're just, um, it's new and trying it, but our other systems allow people to go on to our website, this DYCD mm -hmm. um, website, so that they can find uh, other programs that are near where they're either receiving literacy uh, services or even in the same community uh, based organization. But we do have some, uh, some statistics about uh, who we're serving currently. And it, we serve actually 87%, we've served 16,526 uh, uh, participants in FY19. 87 of the, 87% per of the participants are in the English for speak speakers of another language. Um, mm -hmm. The makeup of the participants are there's 52% Hispanic, 20% uh, Asian, 15% white, and 13% black or African American. Okay. Um, have you noticed any specific demographic trends in, um, in the individuals that are requiring services? I would say that the, the, the changes um, in the demographics is that there are more people of different countries, so the diversity, I think, has widened 
and that, and that uh, we're seeing more people and know that um, we, we have programs that actually uh, uh, give services in, in a, could be a hundred different languages. So we know that it's the, the span is widening in, in terms of the number of, of ethnicities or cultures or languages that are spoken. So that I can speak to. The, maybe perhaps you can speak to the others. Okay. I mean, you know, um, really our programs, as you know, they're all in the communities, uh, all five boroughs. So depending on where you go, so if you go to Upper Manhattan, Washington Heights, Inwood area, you will see mostly uh, Hispanic, you know, Spanish speaking population. Mm -hmm. There is a heavy need for English language services. Um, coming downtown in Lower East Side, and you will see a uh, heavy presence of Chinese population, Asian population. In Chinatown area, we have a few programs. And you go to Southern Br Brooklyn, you will see Russians uh, over there. Um, and in the Carroll Gardens, uh, Carroll Gardens area in Brooklyn, you will see Arabic population. And we also see that there is a growth of African population in the Bronx. You know, we've seen in those programs. Mm -hmm. So yes, there we, did, we do observe some of those changes and the programs are all neighborhood uh, programs and they address those needs uh, immediately and quickly uh, with their staffing with the appropriate language uh, competencies. Um, I, I know that uh, Council Member Eugene has some questions, but I'd, I'd like to ask you um, about Intro 649 and um, uh, what, are, uh, what are your concerns with this? Do you have any concerns with this bill? Um, and what is the feasibility of your supporting it? Uh, we def I mean, m most importantly, I think we support English language learners in our programs. We certainly uh, appreciate the spirit of this bill. We, we think that after school is an amazing place for young people who, uh, for whom English is not their first language and who, who have limited English proficiency. Um, in our programs, we cited a few of the examples of the type of ways that our programs specifically address a language barrier or support families of young people who are um, non-English speaking. But I think um, generally the way all our programs are framed, uh, which is to address the language barrier or other barriers that young people are experiencing to connection that the, but specific to English language learners, um, having more time, the research is, is evolving, but having more time in an after school setting is very helpful to non English speaking students in after school. Um, also, the environment of after school is um, can be very supportive and less stressful in that there aren't um, high stakes markers for for achievement as there as there are during the school day. Um, so young people can relax a little bit more, get comfortable. They might feel more um, when they if they don't speak English comfortably, they might feel more, com more, more comfortable experimenting, speaking to their peers, speaking to a caring adult um, without such a high stakes engagement. Um, and then our programs are really very supportive in terms of young people's uh, motivation levels, social emotional learning, which is also a critical factor for English language learners. Um, so we, we, yes, we support English language learners and I, want, you know, I look forward to sharing more of the ways that we do this in our programs. So you would, um, so are there any barriers to, that you see to this bill being um, uh, supported by DYCD? I think we still have a lot of open questions. Um, there are many unknowns for exactly what the implications of the bill would be and we are, ready to work with council to, 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 to talk through any of those. Um, it, we just, um, we just have a lot of questions essentially. I mean, what the impact of the bill will depend on um, the individual experience of the provider and their current staffing models and the students who are in their programs. So 
um, we 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 do feel that there's there are more there are more questions to ask. I'm about. gonna I'm I'm gonna uh, yield to uh, Council Member Eugene. I I'm sure he has some questions and um, and then I'll come back. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. Let me first and foremost uh, thank you and commend you for your leadership in addressing the issues uh, that affect the young people in New York City, the future of this uh, city. Thank you so much, and thank you for this wonderful, uh, 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 very important uh, public hearing also. And I want to thank your staff also. Thank you. And thank you. And I want to thank uh, Deputy Commissioner and all the members of the panel. Uh, I want to thank you for what you are doing through DYCD, the wonderful job and uh, the excellent program that DYCD is offering to the young people and adults also in New York City. And I had the opportunity to work closely with DYCD. And I said that before I was elected also, I was uh, in the other side also because I, I created a non-for-profit organization serving young people. And I know the wonderful job that the DYCD is doing but what I want to say, my father always said that there is no perfection. There's always room for improvement. We should always work together to implement and to uh, better what we are doing. Uh, I am pleased to, you know, I'm so pleased uh, to have introduced uh, into, into uh, legislation into 649. I think this is a very, and I, I'm pleased that uh, you, you are willing to support it. And myself and the city council, we will be sitting, you know, we'll be very pleased to hear your concern and to work together to make it work. But uh, let me ask a very few questions. We all know that New York City is home to so many people. You know, that's what makes New York City great and vibrant people from different uh, countries, but they don't speak. English is not the first language. And I think. Uh, Assistant Commissioner Wong Zhang mentioned that there are about 1,028,000 people, I think, in the state of New York or in the city of New York, without, in the, state of, in the city, right? Yes. Without high school. This is a big number. This is a big number. But you mentioned also that uh, DYCD serve about 16,000, is that correct? 16,000 is a very small number when you consider 1,000,000.8. But considering also the importance of literacy, literacy, you know, gave uh, to people the tool they need to succeed in society, and especially in, in a city like New York City. Many people who are in our city, who came to this city, as you know, they have uh, cultural barrier, tradition barrier, language barrier, but when we offer them the opportunity to be literate, that give them the tool to succeed in the society, and we will reduce the crime, the inc incarceration, the poverty. This is a very important issue for the city of New York. My question is that what DYCD has uh, 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 in place or is DYCD is planning to increase the number and to do you know, the necessary effort to serve more people to help them get their high school equivalency? So we want to clarify that um, DYCD uh, uh, serviced um, 16,500, over 16,000 people last year, but we don't do this alone. We do this with the Department of Education who also offers literacy programs with CUNY and with uh, public libraries. And that network of people together with DYCD services 70,000 people. Actually, probably it's over 70,000. But I just wanted to correct the number that it's not just us. It's uh, a lot of people. We couldn't do this alone. And we always um, welcome the opportunity to serve more and serve better. Uh, but we wanted to make that clarification. Um, when, we, when we talk about after school program or literacy program, bilingual language opportunity, language, 
opportunity is very important also. So those people, they don't speak English. English is not the first language. So among your staff people, do you have staff members or people, instructors, teachers, who speak different languages based on the population of a uh, student or uh, a constituent they are serving? I'll start talk, just talking a little bit about, um, about that in after school response to that, and I appreciate the question. Thank you for that. Um, Commissioner Chong, um, my colleague, noted that um, service integration and improving the quality of service through information is one of his main priorities, and um, my colleagues, uh, Michael Deutsch and Denise Williams, have been working on improving the capacity of the agency to deliver better services. You mentioned continual quality improvement. So I'm excited that we were able to look into the language of participants, um, and that's part of the new data collection that um, efforts that DYCD has, has launched regionally recently. So um, I am able to give you more answer to that question now because we have better information. Um, and we, we had, in after school, we had hundreds of staff that had been tagged by the program provider in the system as speaking a non-English language. Um, at least 14 languages were noted, Albanian, Arabic, Bengali, Ch Chinese, French, Haitian, Creole, Hin Hin Hebrew, Hindi, and, and several more, including other. Um, so we, yes, we have in the after school, um, and I think this has always been true. We're seeing the data now, but I think people who work in after school programs um, know that this is part of the work that they do is um, an effort to have staff reflect the community that they're serving. So yes, we have um, uh, many staff members who speak English as languages other than English in the programs. So let, let me put it another way. Let's say, for example, you have a class of uh, 100 students and 20 or 30 of them speak, let's say, uh, Spanish or any other language. Are you going to uh, select or appoint or get somebody who speaks Spanish and English to serve the, the, these 30 or 20 students because they represent approximately one third of the, of the class? Yes, please. Um, so we don't necessarily um, enforce a, a specific um, practice but what we have seen in, the, in our after school programs is that our agencies organically design activities and identify staff um, that reflect the, the community. So in, a, in that example of 100 participants and let's say 20 of the young Arturi. people speak, let's say Spanish, um, they An would, example, it could or, be any or other language. Any other language. Um, they would hire, and they oftentimes hire, several staff that speak that predominant language in, in the program so that the young people can um, interact with adults, interact with peers at, in the activity level. So how do you measure the success of the after school program? How do you measure the success of the after school program or literacy program? Well, I'll start with after school. Um, we have a few we have a few different measures depending on the program area. But one thing we look at as a starting point, we look at whether the program is able to engage young people. So we have a contract with community-based providers. If the quality of their work is not excellent, it's less likely that young people will attend and that parents will sign their young people up for the program. So the first thing we look is are they able to engage young people? And, um, and, what, and if they are, how often do those young people participate in programs? So they signed up and they came. Do they keep coming back because they value the service that they're, that they're giving? Um, and in addition to that, we know that there's a lot of support for the after school programs from communities. We see that in advocacy um, you know, year after year. Uh, more specifically, we have independent evaluators who look at outcomes in our programs. Some examples, uh, and again, they vary widely, are do young people feel that they're n learning new skills? Do they feel comfortable um, that they have a supportive peer environment? Uh, do they feel connected that to caring adults in the programs? Um, do they feel that the programs are enhancing their um, leadership skills? We have a comprehensive um, questionnaire that we've implemented with our middle school students about how they're developing leadership skills. 
Um, are, are they getting hours in STEM and literacy? So we, and how do parents feel about those programs? We wanna know about their satisfaction as well as a principal. How does the principal feel about this program supporting their school day? So we have um, multiple measures on the outcomes and the experience of young people in our programs. Yeah, yeah. yeah so you say that uh, part of your uh, strategy to measure the outcome or the success of the program is to find out if the children or students are comfortable with the program, if they are involved, if they keep coming. But when you find out that there are certain issues or the students don't come back to the program, they are not satisfied, what is the step that you take to bring remedy, to, 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 to resolve the situation and to ensure that they come back and they feel comfortable? Do you have staff in place for that? Social workers, psychologists, or professionals to go in exactly and find out what is wrong and how can you resolve the situation? I think, you know, fundamental to positive youth development, which is the, you know, the basis of doing good programming is to help meet a young person where they are, especially the young people who are experiencing barriers. And some of the ways we get to those satisfaction or dissatisfaction questions is through our customer service questionnaire. We're, we're launching um, uh, additional questionnaires in all of our programs. We did a pretty comprehensive assessment of Beacon participants in prior years to find out are they getting what they need and what we'll look at where the demand is that maybe we're not hitting. One, I, on the top of my head, I can think of um, one thing that really made an impression on our agency was that a lot of participants ha felt like food insecurity was one of their main concerns. And um, as a participant of the program, we've been uh, ma making efforts to connect food services with the pro programs. And then we also, look, we have a hotline. I mentioned the hotline in multiple languages, and sometimes we get specific complaints about a program. Um, it doesn't happen very often, but we are welcome those concerns. We look forward to responding immediately to any of those concerns. Talk to the parent, talk to the young person, negotiate a more positive outcome with the provider. Um, those are a few things I can think of off the top of my head. Okay, this is my last question. Bilingual program and also literacy program are very important program. They benefit not only the student, but also the city of New York and the society. I know you are trying to do the best that you can do. What is the biggest challenge that you face in trying to provide literacy and bilingual program to the people who are in need? What is the biggest challenge? Or if there is no challenge, no, that's course, when everything course, is okay. Of course there <laughs> are. Um, I, yeah, I, please. I see the biggest challenge, and I think that's something that's beyond this, is just that in the youth development field, there's a high demand for staff, um, and there's a shortage of staff. Um, so I think that that would be the one um, challenge um, that I see for our providers is hiring qualified staff that meet our DOH and SAT credentialing um, requirements and regulations, while at the same time having the um, experience in, in this field. So that, I would say, would be the challenge. Yes. Yeah, I agree with that. That's a micro challenge, meaning like on a specific program level, and it's kind of a macro challenge across the city. Um, as a direct result, I think, of the great expansion we've had in mm -hmm. this administration for youth services, um, it's the capacity question that you were asking that was being asked about uh, literacy programs earlier. We continue to expand after school program, in particular for middle school students and community centers, and we need there's the, we need more staff in an after-school program than you need in the school day because the staff mm -hmm. ratios are higher. And um, so mm -hmm. one of our challenges has been helping providers meet that, meet those needs, helping them with recruitment efforts, connecting to arts, um, it, uh, adults in arts, arts professionals, um, connecting with CUNY. Um, we're constantly trying to help mm -hmm. respond to that. And to conclude, what is uh, your process to recruit staff? when you need to recruit some staff, what is your process? The process you're going through. How, did you, how, do, how do you do that to recruit staff? They, I think providers, I mean, they start in their own community, I think, with staff recruitment. Um, 
It could be from people who are coming up through the programs, people grow up in programs and become staff members, and I think there's, a, there's been in recent years like a, a stronger effort toward career development. If I'm a group leader in a program, how do I develop my skills that I can mm -hmm. become a program director so we have the higher level positions? Um, there, there are the more traditional methods of mm -hmm. advertising on, um, mm -hmm. we have some websites specifically dedicated to um, recruiting youth professionals. We also, as an agency, through our capacity um, building department, provide um, resources and training for the providers, um, staff development, career development, um, how do you facilitate um, a curriculum, how do you manage a classroom. So from the agency's perspective, we try to provide resources um, beyond what the providers do at the local level. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you so very much. Thank you so much, um, Council Member Eugene. Um, I have a couple of nitty gritty questions. Um, how many programs are within your adult literacy program portfolio? And um, what is the breakdown of the number of participants um, per specific program? And what is the cost per p participant? in each of these programs. Whoops. We have, <laughs> we have uh, 77 base contracts, 40 uh, discretionary contracts, and we, the price per participant is 950. Um, when uh, in 2014, we, uh, increased that price per participant from 500 to 950. You increased uh, that when? In, in, in 2014, when that, the, in that last RFP. Um, and we, uh, in terms of your last question about how many participants are in each uh, one of those contracts, we can send that information okay. to you. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, and yeah, oh, um, we, have, we do have the information. So um, it, you know the program very well, so the, the, the several areas just pointed out. So out of the 16,200 some people we served last year, um, in the ESL program we have about 12,500. So as San, uh, Commissioner uh, Gutierrez just mentioned, the, the ESL population accounts for about 78% of the total we serve. And in our ABE programs, we have 2,800, a little over 2,800 in there. Mm -hmm. And then the smallest portion um, is the high school equivalency uh, students, is 930, somewhere there. Um, so I just wanted to point out is that in DYCD's um, program, programming, it, it actually stated in our RFP clearly that we want programs to focus on lower levels. So we basically say, said that we would like to see, you know, anywhere between 50 to 60% of students be at the lowest level that other programs do not serve or cannot serve. Um, so, and that's one of the reasons why, you know, our population for the high school equivalency program, the HSE programs is small. And in ESL, if you further look at it mm -hmm. and more people at, uh, at the lowest you know, levels. And um, your adult literacy, what was the, your adult literacy programs, what was the number? The In adult, your adult over 18 years of age? Oh, the adult programs? literacy program serves people 16 and over. Mm -hmm. And uh, within that population that we serve, uh, we, most of people are between, most of the people we serve are between 25 and 44. That's the major. Mm -hmm. And then you have about 20, 25% of the people between 16 and 24. That's the breakdown in terms of age. And that number, what's the total number of people who are enrolled in your adult literacy programs? That's Last year 16, we enrolled 16,000. 16,000, yeah. okay. Yeah. Um, and are there, is there a waiting list? And um, if so, how do you um, 
plan to reduce that that list. Is are there waiting lists for services? Well, in terms of uh, waiting list, mm -hmm. you know, uh, each agency, you know, automatically documents, you know, people that they cannot put it place in the classes immediately. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yes, all programs have their own wait list. Um, and we know that on average, there are probably about anywhere between 400 and 600 people on the waiting list. Mm -hmm. uh, but that, you know, that's not, we don't know how accurate that, that is. For example, a, a person can walk into a program asking for, for service, but if you don't have an opening at this point, mm -hmm. and that person could, you put them on the wait list, the person could go walk down to another program that's down the block and get enrolled. So, you know, we are not sure how accurate that is, mm -hmm. um, but um, there certainly is a wait list and uh, peop uh, you know, programs, that's why we, we always try to convene programs and do networking and have programs know that there are other programs, you know, in your neighborhood, there are other programs somewhere else. So you can always make sure that you can refer people to other programs instead of them ha instead of having them wait for for services. So um, yes. Do you think there's a need to increase the number of programs that um, that we have that are providing the services? Uh, certainly. Um, you know, with council support, last few last three years, this is the fourth year. We are we you know we were able to actually enroll a lot more people because of the expanded dollar literacy funding. Did uh, we actually increase the number of programs that we're, you are now contracting with uh, as opposed to? With the expansion funding, what we did was that we, uh, for example, this year we plan to actually expand 55 contracts. You know, of course, this is will be at the request of CBOs too. We cannot just go there and impose a mm -hmm. an increase. So we have them understand that there is additional funding to support, and they have to take into consideration their capacity in terms of the staffing space and everything else, and then make a request. So we are expanding 55 contracts this year to serve an additional 4,000 people this year, and uh, council has designated. 40 some contracts, uh, 40 some awards over Will they there. be new contracts or, yeah. or just these are in addition old, to um, existing services? Th no, these are in addition to what okay. PYC these existing contracts. Mm -hmm. And that we do contracts with them, we support them, we provide staff development. Um, they serve another, close to another 4,000 people. So we're talking about an additional 8,000 people each year. Okay. What data? So, um, can I can I expand yeah, oh, on yes, that a little bit because I want us to um, manage expectations around this. I think that you know what I, what we said before was that we wanted to make sure as we did this work on uh, literacy that uh, literacy services to balance capacity building with the growth of the need, right, uh -huh. or, or or responding to the need, and um, we wanted to make sure that if. Uh, we we say okay we want to we want to uh, services for 100,000 people. Is there capacity building money? Is there capacity building support to do that so that we can keep the quality services? Why are the quality services so important? They have always been important, but they're much more important now because when uh, people who are learning having to learn literacy skills, the job environments expect much more of them than they used to. So it used to be that uh, immigrants who came to this country went for a particular kind of job. That is no longer true. They, they can go to, through, to, they can aspire to any kind of job, which can include uh, uh, skills in technology, skills, uh, other kinds of skills that in the past they might not have needed. So we have to continue to improve uh, capacity in terms of quality instruction, but also be more diverse in terms of not just giving uh, language skills, but language skills in context to a new, uh, a, a new workforce, right? A new workforce environment, a new expectation about 
how someone uses language skills in the workplace. So it's not, we used to have workplaces where people didn't talk, right? They went to work, they made cars, you didn't have to talk too much. Mm -hmm. But now you have to be socially adaptable in that environment and it means that you need language skills beyond uh, just language, but communication skills, social skills, and those kinds of things. Be uh, adaptive with, with um, social media, all kinds of things that were not the expectations before. And so um, when, it, do, do we have a need? Yes, the need continues to grow because there's more and more uh, immigrants coming into into the U.S. and we have a, a considerable population that does not have a high school diploma even if they were born here. But it is the same challenge, right, that we have to stop thinking about literacy as people just learning how to speak English or, or learning uh, math, but that we have to think about literacy um, skills as language acquisition plus all of these other things that are expected to them if the they are to be successful. The broader definition of literacy. Um, so um, are you saying that um, when you say we need to in ensure that the capacity is there, are you talking about the capacity to meet those needs, um, not in terms of space, spatially, but in, um, I guess, the intellectual, um, ability or staffing staff uh, that we have enough people to staff these programs that can meet um, meet our learners at you know at the level that they need to be engaged at absolutely Is that, okay um, so do you collect any data from these programs um, Regarding, you know, um, success, uh, where they're going, what, or is there any type of data that you collect from uh, our, our providers or the contracted providers? Oh, yeah, sure. Um, in, a, in addition to the demographic, very important demographic information mm -hmm. we have there, um, we also collect, you know, household income. Uh, in terms of success of programs, we, you know, all students coming into the program taking a, what we call a pretest, uh -huh. establish the baseline, and then they, you know, participate in, in classes, and then, then they are post-tested period, periodically. So we record, you know, what we call incremental progress, that is, mm -hmm. you know, the, the small baby step programs you make, we, we, we document that. We also have an expected uh, educational gain outcome, which is students need to move from one prescribed level to another level. So just to uh, give you uh, what we had last year, last year we, we just said we served over 16,000 people. Uh, we had 56% of the people who actually made a one level gain, which is the Right. the outcome mm -hmm. expectation and the you know the majority of the people made of course the baby step progress do you evaluate these programs um, and and what is the um, you know oh yeah what, so what's the rubric that you use evaluation is something that's very important uh, we have contract managers that manage those contracts. Mm -hmm. So we, our staff go out to observe and visit programs uh, regularly. And when they, when, they, when they get there, they not only talk with program directors, staff, but also with students. We also observe classrooms. And uh, following each visit, we have a report that we write up, uh, basically, you know, our what we see there and our comments, and we share our findings with CBOs, um, so that th this, this happens all the time. And these findings from these visits inform our staff development design. So they all go hand in hand. Uh, this is done on a regular basis. Um, so um, I'm assuming that the 
um, instructors that are doing um, what used to be the GED, the, the high school um, uh, graduate exam, mm -hmm. uh, are, are certified teachers or, or no? Are they DOE certified at all of um, these locations? It's, it's both. So DYCD um, do not require teachers to be certified. Okay. Um, but we do have requirements in terms of qualification. For example, uh, program directors, teachers would have to have a bachelor's degree uh, in, a, in a related area with five years <coughs> teaching experience working with adult population. Um, we also have programs that work very closely with the Department of Education. Um, you know, that's, you know, to, to kind of leverage resources. So teachers provided through the Department of Education are very often uh, uh, state certified. Um, what follow-up services or programs does DYCD provide to those who complete the literacy programs, um, like job search uh, programs, uh, uh, things of that nature? Okay. The um, helping students transition is something that we've been emphasizing the last few years. Mm -hmm. um, be it next step would be employment, employment training programs, or college. Since this is a literacy literacy program that we're talking about, we look a lot at the next steps, moving students from ESL to ABE programs, ABE students to HSE programs. That's the, you know, that's the biggest effort that we make in moving students you know, uh, on this continuum. And those students that are in the HSE programs, we connect them, you know, we try to do everything we can to actually provide uh, college and career advisement uh, in that area. Um, programs do work with um, CUNY colleges to connect s students who are ready uh, for the next steps. Um, at this point, we do not have specifically have, uh, we, our funding does not specifically, you know, focus on follow-up, um, but we do realize that the transition the uh, helping students, making sure that they get to the next step, uh, it's, it's important. So we, we convene them, we talk with, about this, um, but we do not have specific requirements on those. Um, in the past adopted budgets uh, where the council and the administration have secured $12 million for adult literacy programming, the funding was shared between DYCD, the Mayor's Office of Immigration Affairs, and DOE's um, Community Schools Initiative. In fiscal year 2020, how much of the $12 million went to DYCD? Uh, right now, you know, the final plan has not been uh, uh, approved yet, but we, we have proposed to amend our existing contracts uh, and also provide the necessary support to the programs. We are spending about six million dollars um, uh, of the 12 million within DYCD contracts, and then there is the four million that's going to be uh, designated contracts through through the council. So we're talking about 10 million dollars that DYCD is going to manage. Um, what is the estimated cost per participant in a bilingual after-school program, and how does that cost compare with an after-school program that's conducted only in English? Uh, I, don't, I don't have any information about that right now, and even the question about how much after-school costs can vary, whether you're talking about an elementary school, middle school student, how many hours. There's so many variables in the cost. Um, I don't know what the answer to offering bilingual instruction in after school would be.
Um, can you uh, venture to say that there's some appreciable difference in, in the cost? I would say yes. Yeah, I would say yes. Um, and Primarily in staffing costs. And so um, is that because you would have to pay bilingual staff more than um, staff that did not have another language? That skill? could be. It could also be the necessity to um, maybe it's hiring additional staff. Is it getting rid of some staff or replacing other staff? Is it the cost of managing your staffing model altogether? Um, the adm additional administrative work. I staff hours. Yeah, staff hours. Oh, yeah, it could vary on. Yeah, many factors. Many unanswered questions, I would say, to get to that point. Do you think that the uh, the difference is enough to um, rule out having bilingual after school programming um, across the board? I don't think I could say that, but I do think there could be an appreciative cost to the nonprofit providers. Yeah, I think it's possible. I know we've talked a lot about, you know, cost and, you know, it's, it's very hard to sort of quantify some of the, the, um, the values that you might need to, to come up with a figure, but um, I would like to see you sort of put together what it would cost to, um, to have bilingual after school programming. I, I will take that request back and also raise that the, um, the research to answer that question wouldn't be accessible in-house to DYCD again because the impact on individual programs, 1,200 or so individual programs would um, depend on many factors including their current staffing models, their current student population, those things are fluid the skill level of young people today, the skill level of young people in six months. Um, but I will take that request back. Okay, well you've already, I, I think, made some sort of um, um, assessment because you're talking about expanding um, the after school um, literacy programs now, aren't you? Um, we uh, talked yeah. about that previously. No, those are not after school programs. Those are the adult programs. Oh, okay, okay, okay. This is adult literacy, so um, the price per participant is gonna be very different than a, a, a price a after school, after after school, school after price school. per participant for all the reasons that um, uh, Assistant Commissioner ha uh, Haskell talked about before, which is that you know there's very different criteria for after school um, uh, certainly um, expectations and uh, it, it costs a lot more to uh, to have a, a child in after school than to have an adult who takes care of themselves brings themselves a to to a class um, so it's a it's it, it's a the price per participant is, is less than being able to give bilingual education to a child in after school. Sort of apples and oranges. <laughs> okay, so I just want to know: <clears throat> Is this something that we can we we can expect that you would look at and and try to give us, you know, a number? Let's let's continue the conversation about that. Let's. Let's talk with, you know, let me bring this back to DYCD and we'll work with council and council finance on any questions around this. And, um, and my last question is, um, how do you interact and interface with the other literacy programs like First Readers, other um, sort of community-based literacy programs? Is there any kind of interaction and and sort of what is the mechanism that you use to to have that yes if I understand your question I would say absolutely yes maybe um, 
Wanda could talk about the connection between the literacy programs and our community centers? Mm -hmm. So we have several programs um, that have both the literacy component and the beacon mm -hmm. component that exist in one school. Um, and oftentimes we find that in some cases it's the same provider, which is fantastic because then they have the literacy piece, it's the staffing structures within that agency, and then they have the, ap they have the after school component. Um, and what they do is that they integrate those services, um, you know, as a very seamless um, in that model where they serve as a referral and vice versa um, from the after school to um, the adult literacy during, during the day. Um, we like to say that we're almost like um, serving the whole family. So you may have the adult learner in the um, ESL program while their um, children are attending the after school um, program. And that's how we see those things happening. Um, and I did want to add that some of our providers, um, especially in our Beacon and our Cornerstone programs, they're required to co-locate um, with other entities um, or smaller agencies that may not have the infrastructure to run a comprehensive program, but they're utilized to enhance um, services within the after school program. Mm -hmm. um, and I've seen programs, um, in particular one in Chinatown where they had um, beginners and advanced um, levels of basic literacy and, and learning just the basics of even just grocery shopping, like how do you ask for oranges and apples to actual conversations. And in, these, and in this particular example, I was able to see 20 plus adults in three different classrooms learning different types of functionalities um, around literacy and just everyday living. Thank you. Um, what are the city agencies or agencies um, does DYCD work with to address the problems associated with illiteracy like DOE and HRA? Um, can you describe the nature of the interagency interactions and um, have any other programs resulted from this interagency collaboration? Well, we did uh, mention that we work with uh, the Department of Education on uh, sharing teachers or uh, making sure that there's a referral system back and forth. Um, we have had uh, conversations with them around literacy strategies or um, how we could do that better, those referral systems. With CUNY, we have, uh, we really, rely on CUNY for, uh, to help us with staff development and that sort of thing and all, but also to uh, introduce our young people who have gone through literacy programs and then have uh, completed their uh, high school education so that they can enter college and stay in college. Um, and of course, we talked about the, the need and uh, the the, the collaboration that we have with the public libraries. Um, we have in the past talked with uh, HRA um, about literacy in the context of job training and job development. Um, and um, some of that, those discussions continue to go on uh, because as you know, we have a lot of, uh, a lot going on at DYCD in the development of job, uh, of jobs and uh, employment and career training. So uh, wh wherever there's an opportunity for us, and this is in the spirit of what we have said before, in the spirit of our mission, and certainly um, with um, Commissioner Chung's leadership about integrating services, but that's not just integrating services among uh, the community-based organizations. It's not just uh, about integrating services among uh, even our internal units, but it is among those city agencies who have the same interest in, in, uh, in helping uh, New Yorkers just thrive and, 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 uh, and succeed. So obviously, we, we're gonna be talking to HRA, we talk to um, the Department of Health, whoever 
you, you know, because DYCD has such a large footprint in terms of the services that are provided, right? And particularly because we have a focus on alleviating poverty. It's in our interest, but it's also in the interest of other city agencies to work with us, to partner and to develop all kinds of strategies where people could use the services. I think everybody wants the same thing, that we want New Yorkers to use, to be able to access first, mm -hmm. to be informed, to be able to access, and then to be able to participate in services so that the city gets better. So, uh so <clears throat> I assume they're members of the ICC um, and they address literacy as um, part of Correct. the I believe the that, mission. Uh, yes, the, the ICC, we made a recent uh, presentation to them, actually. Right. Um, so this, uh, every time there is a quarterly meeting, mm -hmm. um, this is made known to our providers. and. Uh, if I remember correctly, we have actually had student representatives speak, talking about their programs, the, um, the progress they make uh, at those uh, meetings. Um, so yes, and also talking about, and you asked a very important question, that is, you know, collaboration and partnership with other entities. You know, in addition to the city agencies that we work with, you know. It's, it's in order to achieve that, what we always say, you know, co collective impact, you, you need to really reach out to other, right. uh, other services. You know, we, this is literacy services, so we want, we, we try our best to kind of connect our programs to uh, entities like city tutors, New York Cares, um, yeah, RSVP of uh, Community Services Society. Right. So there are a lot of you know, untapped resources out there. For example, uh, just yesterday we had a providers meeting and where we have folks from RSVP do a presentation on their volunteer program. Mm -hmm. You know, they have retired people from all sorts of fields and who can actually s serve you know, as volunteers for programs. So we not only talked about programs, we actually introduced what forms you need to complete, how are you gonna be able to access those volunteers. We had one agency from Staten Island, JCC, mm -hmm. actually talked about their experience working with uh, RSVP, and uh, mm -hmm. they just feel that it's such you know, a, a, an asset that we certainly cannot just let it slip by, and we gotta use them. So, um, you know, the programs have specific requests, like they need tutors, they need for ESL learners, they need conversation partners, uh, you know, and you need people who help them with digital literacy. So there are lots of talents out there, and we, this is what we do. We want to connect programs to those and leverage the, the resources. Thank you. Um, and what is the impact of, on children of adults who struggle with literacy, um, you know, for example, um, children who are more like, are, are there children who are more likely to suffer because of low literacy among, you know, their parents? Uh, oh yeah, definitely. I mean, lots of research points to that. Mm -hmm. You know, children with educated parents come to school with much, much larger vocabulary, for example, they're, you know, they're gonna be able to, 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 to benefit from the reading and access, you know, reading materials much easier than kids, you know, from families, you know, from parents that do not read and write. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the reasons uh, that our programs, the adult literacy programs, you know, make Address sure. That. Yes, and we also integrate you know, parent involvement, family involvement, family engagement is one of the things that we emphasize uh, in our programs. Okay, I, I said three questions ago. I know I said three questions ago it was the last question. I, I just wanted to see if you were still paying attention. No, um, and this is the last one. <laughs> the, this is the last one. <laughs> 
<laughs> How many school districts in New York City have more than one third of the total number of students being English language learners? How is this measured and how is this reported? Uh, I don't know the answer to that question. I think, like, as I oh, you're gonna fail the test at the end. No, no, no. What I do know is you were doing I, so good. <laughs> as I stated earlier, we have more and more information about our programs and what is. I think you know the spirit of this conversation is around what is a young what's happening with a young person who doesn't speak English in our programs and so we have better participant data which I shared a bit in our testimony um, I spoke to um, the number of staff we have I also wanted to mention that our data shows that we have hundreds of program activities within um, within after school that flag that a non-English language is being supported by the program activity. I think some of the examples we gave in testimony, um, we have many, many more examples. At least 18 l other language, non-English languages are represented in an activity that's going on in the program. Um, so I think, I think the focus, what we learned in looking at this data um, in preparation for this hearing is the 5,000, approximately 3% of young people in our programs who aren't uh, reporting that they speak English well and I think that's the young person that we're trying to impact with the the framework that we put around our programs to make sure they're connected mm -hmm. to peers and caring adults and making sure that their experience is positive and that they continue to develop those literacy skills which are so important do you think it's possible for you to get me that number though can you um, say the um, specifics? Yes, we can I want to know partners. how many school districts in New York City have more than one third of the total number of students being English language learners. Okay. Okay. And how? Excuse me. Because um, yes, and we want to know how it's measured and reported because it's an important part of um, the bill that we're interested in passing we'll reach out to our partners. So now I'll say thank you so much for um, your testimony and your time. Um, and uh, uh, congratulations on the resource guide being, you know, out and available. Um, and uh, again, thank you for your cooperation. And any of those numbers we asked for, um, I'm sure you'll be follow, uh, following up with uh, getting to our administration. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. And so, uh, oh, you can call her. <laughs> Our next panel will be? Okay, uh, Lisa Schwaltzwald, New York Immigration Coalition, Ira Zanquit, Literacy Assistance Center, NYC, Coalition for Adult Literacy, Lena Cohen, United Neighborhood Houses, and Nancy Robles, Val Voices of Women. Hi, as soon as you can, uh, sit down, give us your name and your affiliation, and you can begin your testimony. I did say hi while you were getting seated, but I'll, I'll say it again. Um, thank you for being here this afternoon. Well, it's not quite afternoon yet, um, this morning. And um, please uh, give us your name, uh, your affiliation, and you can begin your testimony. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you, Chair Rose, for the opportunity to testify. My name's Ira Yanquit, and I'm the Executive Director of the Literacy Assistance Center, a 36-year-old nonprofit organization dedicated to strengthening and expanding the adult education system and to advancing adult literacy as a foundation for equal opportunity and social justice. Today, I'll be testifying on behalf of the New York City Coalition for Adult Literacy, or NICAL, a coalition comprised of adult literacy teachers, program managers, students, and allies from over 40 community-based organizations, CUNY campuses, and library programs across the five boroughs. Today in New York City, there are approximately 2.2 million adults who lack English language proficiency, 
a high school diploma, or both. The majority of these adults are immigrants. Others were born in the United States, but underserved by the public school system. Many of these adults are unemployed or live in poverty. Most are people of color. Limited skills impact almost every aspect of their lives, making it difficult for them to secure living wage jobs, support their children in school, advocate for their rights as workers, access quality health care, and fully participate in the political process. Yet public funding for adult literacy education is so limited that fewer than 4% of these 2.2 million adults are able to access basic education, high school equivalency, or English language classes in any given year. NICAL is grateful to the City Council for championing the cause of these adults and for securing a $12 million expansion of adult literacy funding and services for each of the past four years. Unfortunately, this funding and these services are just the tip of the iceberg. When it comes to funding for adult literacy, there are really three issues. The first is the paucity of the funding itself, which shuts the doors to over 95% of those adults in need. The second is the unreliable nature of the current funding streams, which, pose, which poses a continuous threat to program stability, staff continuity, and the ability to fully achieve program and policy goals. The third is the inadequacy of the funding formulas and rates, which undermine programs' ability to provide the full array and depth of services that students need. In December of 2017, my organization released a report entitled Investing in Quality, a Blueprint for Adult Literacy Programs and Funders. Funded by DYCD, the report details 14 building blocks of a comprehensive community-based adult literacy program, identifies the resources needed to fully implement the building blocks, and includes a first-of-its-kind cost model. Based on our cost model, we found that community-based adult literacy programs would need to have their current funding rates increased by at least four times in order to fully implement the components and services outlined in the report. While this might sound like a big leap, we know that at current funding rates, many of the critical program, program components that we identify, such as full-time teachers, counseling, support services for students, workforce transition services, professional development and planning time for staff, and integrated technology are often compromised. NICAL is calling on the City Council and the Mayor to take two crucial steps toward creating a city that truly provides educational opportunity for all. First, baseline the $12 million for DYCD-funded adult literacy services and combine these funds with the existing $3.5 million in previously baseline funding. Then, once the baseline funding level for adult literacy services is increased, issue a new adult literacy RFP that establishes a funding rate that will enable programs to provide the high-quality, comprehensive services that all adult students deserve. Currently, DYCD-funded programs are funded at $950 per student, as we heard earlier. NICAL is calling on the next DYCD RFP to establish a rate of no less than double that amount, and ideally up to four times that amount, consistent with the rate identified in our analysis. NICAL believes that being able to read and write, speak and understand English, obtain an equivalency diploma, and successfully enter job training or post-secondary education are the rights of every New Yorker and that every adult in need should be able to access high-quality adult literacy services. If we are truly a city committed to equal opportunity and social justice, we should expect no less. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify. Well, it's still morning, so good morning, uh, Chair Rose. Thank you so much for holding this hearing. I think it's a, a really excellent step that the council is taking to provide as much oversight over these critical adult literacy services, and we're really happy to be speaking with you today, and hopefully, you know, a, a really productive relationship will develop so that we can strengthen New York City's adult literacy program. My name is Lena Cohen. I am here on behalf of United Neighborhood Houses. Uh, we've had we've had the pleasure of working with you on a range of issues, uh, especially this last year over the um, salary parity and whatnot. So thank you for. Yes, ab absolutely. We are lucky to be partners with you. Um, another issue that United Neighborhood Houses focuses on is adult literacy. Uh, our network of 42 settlement houses across the state reaches 765 New Yorkers um, from all walks of life. And right now we're in our 100th year of mobilizing settlement houses and their communities to be uh, leaders in strengthening uh, their access to important public programs and civic engagement opportunities and so much more. UNH leads advocacy with our partners, uh, such as the New York City Coalition for Adult Literacy on a broad range of issues, including civic engagement, uh, youth services, early childhood education, uh, as well as senior services, and of course, immigrant services and adult literacy. 
Um, so we thank the City Council for passing a budget that included 12 million for adult literacy over the past few fiscal years. It's been a really um, important step that the Council and the administration have taken to provide uh, the 2.2 million New Yorkers in the city that lack either an English proficiency, a high school diploma, or both. Um, but the available programming only serves a small fraction of the need. Uh, right now we're looking at a population of 3% that it has access to English literacy services. Um, and so that really puts us in a difficult position when we consider uh, the broad crisis that we're, uh, you know, we're trying to battle. DYCD funded adult literacy programs are truly excellent. They are so important to invest in because they serve people in need that are barred from participating in many other types of adult education programs. A lot of the other programs focus on things like workforce outcomes and whatnot, and that really uh, tends to leave out the lowest level learners that community-based organizations such as settlement houses focus on. As we heard in the DYCD testimony, uh, their programs are really structured to serve at least 50% um, learners that are at the lowest levels and so that's why these programs are so essential to invest in and fund because they work and the data proves that and um, it's just a question of whether or not we're allowed or we have the funds to really meet the, the growing need. Additionally, uh, DYCD funded programs are open to all residents regardless of citizenship status. So given uh, the growing uh, attacks against immigrant communities and other adult literacy learners such as public charge, these programs are really uh, essential in terms of providing a safe space for immigrants and their uh, other students and allies to connect with teachers at community-based organizations in the context of learning English and trying to improve their lives. Uh, however, uh, you know, we are extremely thankful for the, the partnership that we've established with the council and the administration to secure these additional 12 million expansion dollars, uh, but they haven't been baseline yet. And of course that leaves providers year after year with uncertainty as to whether they can keep the door open or retain their staff. And this perennial uncertainty really prevents programs from expanding and achieving the goals that we all want them to be able to achieve. So that's why uh, we're really excited to work with you and your colleagues in the council to get these dollars baseline once and for all in fiscal year 2021 so that we can then focus on the other things that my colleague uh, Ira was talking about, such as the lower reimbursement rates. As Ira mentioned, uh, the, the DYCD commission report in 2017 that the Literacy Assistance Center conducted showed that providers are only receiving um, $950 per student uh, and that rate is not anywhere close to what they really need to provide high quality service. However, the, the uh, community-based organizations that provide these services are committed to meeting the students' needs and so they often dip into their other funding streams such as general operating dollars and whatnot to make sure that they're able to uh, support their students. That leaves them with a deficit year after year. Um, they're willing to take that on because it is such an important service to provide English classes, but the city uh, should really, you know, um, consider the fact that in order to uh, provide sustainable funding for these programs, we do really need higher reimbursement rates, and we're excited to uh, work with you all to figure out how we can make that happen in a way that allows us to address the gap in uh, education among adults, as well as meet providers where they need to be met. And um, we think that's possible because uh, these programs are structured in a really helpful and productive way and we hope to work with you to see them grow in the next year. So thank you for uh, hearing this testimony and we're excited to partner with you. <clears throat> All right, well, is, is it afternoon yet? We're <laughs> yeah, I, we're five minutes over now, so <laughs> good afternoon, uh, Council Member Rose. My name is Liza Schwartzwald. I am a manager of education policy. I specialize in um, two-generation work, early childhood and adult literacy. Um, at the New York Immigration Coalition. So we are an umbrella policy and advocacy organization of more than 200 groups serving immigrants and refugees across New York State. Um, our member organizations specifically serve the needs of marginalized immigrant communities, including newly arrived immigrants, uh, low-income families, and youth and adults uh, with English, uh, limited English proficiency. 
Um, so we would also, of course, like to thank you uh, and the mayor and the city council for the $12 million investment in adult literacy services. Um, I would say that I absolutely echo uh, what my colleagues Ira and Lena have both said. Um, I would also like to add that across New York State, there are around 971,000 parents of multilingual learners, and I, I apologize, it's not in the written uh, <laughs> testimony, but um, between the ages of zero and eight, and many of those live uh, in New York City, and around 42% of those um, parents are limited English proficient. Um, so when we talk about these adult literacy programs and how important they are, I think that it is also equally important to stress how many parents need to access services and programs like this, not only for their own benefit and for the benefit of workforce, but also because they are their child's uh, access to all of these incredibly important services to their health care, uh, to their um, education, you know, if they want to go to the doctor, if they want to talk to their uh, child's teacher, like all of these are things that they really need this support in doing. And I think we've seen that, that parents truly do so many things on behalf of their children. Um, so when we talk about this fewer than 4% of uh, New Yorkers who need these services not being able to access them, we are also talking about all of those parents. Um, I would also, again, like to echo uh, the, the ask that we baseline that $12 million and combine it with the 3.5 that's already been baselined so that we can really you know, plan year to year for these programs to keep being as strong as they are already. Um, and also to uh, ref um, uh, echo that we also hear from our providers that the um, the amount of money that they get per student is just simply not enough to really cover the costs of running these programs. Um, and again, they do do it anyway. Uh, I think particularly in the, uh, the world that we currently live in when immigrants are really under attack, being able to, to access resources like this that can help them on the immigration path and that can help them to really integrate and join their communities and then give back um, is, um, incredibly important. So I just want to say thank you again for having us here today, and I look forward to working with you in the future. Good afternoon. My name is Nancy, and I am a survivor of domestic violence and a member of Voices of Women known as VOW. VOW is a grass roots organization of survivors of domestic violence who organize to improve the systems that abused women turn to for safety and justice. It's important that we provide services to victims in a safe, compassion, and swift manner. One of the key gaps to improving these services is that many domestic violence services organizations do not have peer delivered services model in place. We believe that agencies that receive funding for domestic violence services should have an active peer delivered service model. They can begin by having all of their employment advertisement include language that encourage survivors of domestic violence to apply. Moreover, we believe that the city council, the Department of Homeless Services, Human Resource Administration and the Mayor's Office to End Domestic and Gender-Based Violence should at the mandate that organizations applying for funding have this model in place within their organization. Hiring survivors help other survivors establish connection with someone who shared a similar story. It connects, sorry, it can, can increase hope which may survivors have lost during an abusive relationship. This is just the beginning and we encourage all who work in the domestic violence services field to put into action a peer delivered service model. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and uh, in, in regard to your comments, uh, about domestic violence and peer-related, um, you know, um, services, 
peer delivered services. Um, are you also um, requesting that uh, these services be delivered in the languages that uh, many of the survivors, um, you know, come come to the agency with? Yes. Um, and so you would want uh, culturally competent peer yes. directed services. Yes. Okay. And um, I thank you for for your courage to, thank you for to come me. and and testify before us today. Uh, and um, and that's something that we would more than um, be uh, willing to to promote. Thank you. So um, I want to thank all of you. And um, I think that I just heard in all of your testimony that you think baselining is a good thing. <laughs> Go figure. No. Um, but um, so you are um, uh, asking that the the funding that we at the level that we currently fund um, that that number be baselined. Um, and it is, is it because of the difficulty in retaining staff uh, from year to year because of the uncertainty of, of uh, the funding or are there other, other um, contributing factors? Yes, exactly. It's, it's both the inability to um, have certainty about being able to maintain staff, which then also becomes an issue about actually being aiming to hire staff because there are fewer people who are willing to take on that uncertainty as teachers. But it's really the instability both of staff and then all of the other program structures um, and, and personnel and resources. So it's, it's teachers, it's counselors, um, it's space concerns. Um, so anything that you need to run a program, um, if you don't know that you're gonna have funding um, in subsequent years, it's hard to make those kinds of commitments. And that's part of why um, it's been sometimes difficult for DYCD to uh, distribute the funds um, as quickly as you might imagine. Programs are very eager to expand their services, but between the fact that in some cases, um, as Lena mentions, they're running at a loss at $950 a student, they can't in increase that loss, and because they don't know that the services are at the funding and the services are gonna extend into the out years, um, they have to re regrettably decline. So it, it's both a staffing issue, uh, uncertainty about staffing, but really uncertainty about every other kind of resource and structure that a program needs to invest in. Uh, DYCD uh, increased the per student um, allocation um, <clears throat> to $950. Um, each of you indicated in your testimony that that's not enough. Um, and, and you said that um, $2,000 per student is a rate. What, what would you say would be um, an acceptable per student rate to provide the quality of services that are needed. So, so my organization, um, as was mentioned earlier in the DYCD testimony, is DYCD's uh, uh, technical assistance provider to the adult literacy programs that they fund. And um, in our first year of having our funding increased as a result of the $12 million in, um, in expansion funding, uh, DYCD, I would say very courageously, um, allowed us to use part of those funds to work with programs to produce a report that says, here's what makes a good program, here are the resources you need, and then to do a cost model budget that where we actually created a hypothetical um, adult literacy program that looked typical of the programs that we see in CBOs throughout the city and, and identified what the costs and went out and did the research, you know, including things like looking at what's the cost of commercial real estate in the South Bronx, right? Um, and so from that, we, did, we came up with a per student cost, which is about four times the current funding rate. So that's why we keep on citing that funding. Um, obviously, uh, there is a tension that if, if we were, even if we were able to baseline the $12 million and have that built into the RFP, if we increase the investment per student at the same baseline amount, that decreases the number of students who would be served. Now, we might 
argue that you know, the ability to provide the kind of quality services that, that these students need um, and the kinds of outcomes we're going to be able to see, not just in terms of workforce or credentialing, but in terms of a parent's ability to support their children, the, the, the ability of an immigrant to really fully participate in the political process to access health care. We might say that that's worth the trade-off in numbers, but there is a tension there. And, you know, and I'm talking off script here, but really what we should be coming to you and asking for is, $50 million, right, so that we can quadruple the, the level of funding in each student, but also maintain and even increase the number served because we're already only serving 3 to 4%. Um, but I'm happy to share that report with you uh, any time, and you could see how we cost it out. Okay. Is there a wait time to get into um, the programs? Uh, yeah, uh, uh, quite a few of them have wait times. I, I think that in terms of, of which of our programs kind of collect that information, how many of them are able to actually bring people in off the wait list, it can definitely vary from program to program and from neighborhood to neighborhood. Mm -hmm. uh, but certainly, I think almost all the programs have some sort of wait list. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right, and, um, and, mm -hmm. and there is some cruelty in keeping wait lists because if, if I come to a program and I'm looking for services and I'm put on a wait list, my assumption is that that's real and I'm going to get off that wait list and I'm actually going to get services. And it also may lead me not to look for services elsewhere or to accept services elsewhere if that's the program that I really believe would serve me best. So I know when I ran a program, we re really struggled with whether to keep a wait list at all, you know, because we, we didn't want people to have the false hope that they were going to get in. So, you know, we don't really, we know what the need is in terms of the 2.2 million. We know the number that we're serving in terms of the you know 16,000 that DYCD cited or 60 plus thousand citywide. Mm -hmm. What we don't know is what the demand really is um, because programs are sometimes reluctant to keep wait lists or longer wait lists than is really realistic. What is the largest gap in terms of adult literacy throughout New York City? Um, can it and can it be fixed? In terms of the types of services, in terms of uh, the, in, the, in terms of adult literacy programs, is, um, what would you say is the largest gap? I think, think we probably all would, would could speak to that a little differently. I mean, I think something that I've observed um, from the time I started in the early 90s to now is that as the demographics of the city change, as we have um, and, and welcome more and more immigrants. Um, more of the services have shifted from the basic literacy, basic education, high school equivalency for those who are underserved by the public school system to um, English language classes for immigrants. And even in those basic literacy and high school equivalency programs, uh, often what we're seeing is immigrants who develop English language proficiency then transferring in to get their diploma, which is fantastic. But I think the reality is, um, so much of the, because the capacity is so limited in terms of the number of seats and the demand on part of immigrants is, is so great, not only aren't we serving, you know, the vast majority of immigrants who can use the uh, services, but just a small handful, but it also means that we're seeing fewer and fewer classes um, for those who were born and raised in New York City and didn't graduate from high school. And that concerns me, um, you know, so we, we because by not offering the classes, we're not really seeing what the true demand is, and I don't think we're speaking to a need and a real responsibility we have to serve people who we weren't able to serve, you know, as, as children. Yeah, and I, I would just add, from the Settlement House perspective, the majority of students that seek out classes are working parents, and these are parents that don't uh, necessarily fit the nine to five office job um, image that you know, a lot of people would associate with when you want to schedule a, a class because uh, a settlement house doesn't want to schedule their adult literacy class at 5 p.m. if that's when the, the folks that they want to serve are going to work. So as a result, we've seen a lot of organizations such as University Settlement or Henry Street Settlement uh, or Canva schedule their adult literacy classes at the time that, they, that the parents would be dropping off their children to the early childhood education programs. And so that's why uh, when we talk about the gaps in population served, uh, we have really have to consider um, what, what the life model is of the student that's going to the class in addition to all of the age and demographic and social characteristic information that DYCD is, is very good about collecting. 
Um, anecdotally, we, we know that uh, students often have to stop taking classes because it no longer fits with their work schedule. They don't have child care available. And um, if they can only go to a settlement house or a service, they're probably going to choose um, something closer to case management or other types of wraparound social services. The, the language in Schedule C that explains the scope of service for adult literacy programs includes uh, support services such as case management, which is, is it's really mm -hmm. great. Mm -hmm. um, however, because uh, providers are only receiving 950 per student, um, it's really going above and beyond whenever mm -hmm. they're uh, whenever they build in case management into those programs. And so again, it's just, it goes back to the issue of programs operating on a deficit, programs being unable to uh, plan for the years ahead due to the lack of baseline funds. And then when we talk about the wait list, it's like how can they really um, get to the wait list when they're just trying to make sure that on uh, July 1st, their doors will still be open. I would, I would add, in addition to agreeing absolutely with both of those things that um, the NYIC had actually done a series of roundtables this past summer, both in New York City and um, in a couple other places. And what we were really hearing in addition to just the, the difficulty, particularly the difficulty with um, working, uh, working adults was that for parents specifically, oftentimes the goal of learning English was to integrate. Right, so they, they were really just integration factors. They want to be able to go around their neighborhood and and just interact with people and and you know build a home somewhere. And the sort of end goal of a lot of adult literacy funding is very very um, focused on job force development or workforce development, excuse me, and um, high school equivalency. And part of what's great about the DYCD funding is that so much of it does go to lower English proficiency. Um, but there is still a sort of idea, I think, that circulates that like the purpose of adult literacy is ultimately jobs. Right. And mm -hmm. that is not what we always see reflected. Oftentimes you have one parent working, but one parent may not be working. And so their primary focus is really on parenting. Um, and those, that particular population of people are, it's very difficult to get them into classes um, just because there's so few of them to begin with that focus on those levels. And when uh, programs are really being pushed towards these sort of workforce adult literacy uh, programs, mm -hmm. just because that's where quite a bit of the funding exists, mm -hmm. then it really limits the spots that those, you know, that those parents can take to, to do what they want to do. So. And if, if I could just piggyback on that. I mean, throughout this hearing, what we've been talking about are the current publicly funded community-based adult literacy programs. Um, when you ask about gaps and what additional funding might be able to support, I think about organizations that are currently providing services that are not getting publicly funded or the kinds of organizations that could be providing services that aren't getting publicly funded. So, um, and those are often the organizations working most on the grassroots, most contextualizing their work around issues um, in communities. So, um, I think about an organization like Adikar in Queens and Jackson Heights, um, working with the Nepalese community who are providing ESOL classes with volunteer tutors from the community, and they focus on issues like temporary protected status and the rights of nail salon workers, you know, which is a large job but with, within the community. They're not getting publicly funded dollars to do that work. I, I think about the testimony that we heard from the panelists at the end, um, which, which I was very humbled by and really appreciated, why aren't we providing, in addition to other services, adult literacy classes within domestic violence shelters, right? That's where additional funds. So I, I both think about where are the gaps in services in terms of who we know are in need of the traditional services, if you will, but I also think about where the gaps are in terms of the folks who are providing non-traditional services or could be providing services. And that I'd encourage us to expand our thinking about who and where these services could be provided if there were the resources. That's excellent. Um, we're like on the same page. Um, what would a um, sort of a perfect model look like? Um, an adult literacy program. What what are the pieces, the components that you know would make it totally comprehensive? You know, collaborative. Um, you know, is there a um, do do you have like a model program that uh, 
could be actually, um, maybe we could pilot so that we could, so you know, make it a comprehensive. Funny you should ask. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we, um, so, so this report that we produced, and I'd be delighted to send you as many copies as you want, or, or just the link, and you don't even have to, you know, kill the tree. Um, the report is structured such that we actually identify based on research and um, work with programs, uh, program managers, teachers, students in New York City, we identify 14 components of a comprehensive program and we describe them and we summarize them all in one page. So, and it's, it's, it's generic in the sense that they're the components that any program anywhere would need to have in place. Obviously, depending on your community, who you're working with, which of those would be more emphasized, which would be less, it might be different, but these are 14 components of a comprehensive program. Then we went on to say, what describe what the resources you needed to implement them and then the cost. So that's, that's what that report outlines and happy, happy to share that. Um, you know, and what we have come to council um, to discuss for at least the last two years um, and council member Menchaca, who's really championed this issue, has right. been very receptive to. He's um, a very vocal advocate. Absolutely, is yeah. potentially funding a pilot um, where we would identify and we would do this in partnership with council uh, because you obviously know your communities far more than we do, right? Um, where we'd be identified, let's say, five programs that have been providing services within five different communities that would be have the capacity to have their funding quadrupled, consistent with our report, um, to serve the same number of students, but to serve them fully and comprehensively and to be able to build out all those components and let's and and let's think not just about the traditional workforce outcomes or educational gain outcomes, but the range of goals uh, that students have for coming to programs. Let's track their outcomes around that full range of goals, you know, and, uh, you know, maybe most significantly parent um, engagement and parent empowerment. Um, and let's really see, are we right, right? We're, we're, we're coming to you and saying, if you fund these programs at four times the level that they're currently funding at, they're gonna be able to serve their students better and we're gonna see significantly better outcomes. Let's test that. And so we've, we've suggested um, five programs, uh, four times the amount, it's a few million dollars. Uh, Council Member Menchaca has been receptive, we've had those discussions, but we've really never moved forward in seeing that pilot funded. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I was gonna say you don't have to sell me on this. Uh, I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna talk to Council Member Menchaca. We're both on um, the budget negotiating team, which is going to meet shortly. Um, so uh, uh, I uh, I look forward to sort of circling back to um, have an extensive conversation about this. Um, and I just want to ask you um, very quickly. Um, any any feedback, any concerns, or anything about Intro 649 from your perspective? Sure. I, uh, you know, I'll speak on behalf of UNH. We appreciate the council creating this opportunity to discuss the bill, uh, which would, you know, require bilingual uh, staff at after-school programs. As settlement houses are one of the leading providers of after-school programs, you know, our members kind of perked up at this idea and recognize or, you know, we're happy that the council is responding to the need for multilingual access in after-school programs. Um, however, city and state contracts for these programs do not always, uh, or do not provide sufficient funds to allow providers to hire staff that meet all of the language requirements that would be in this legislation. Uh, many programs are working for the minimum wage or just a little more, uh, and thus, you know, a lot of staff at these programs are competing uh, with jobs that offer similar compensation but do not require specialized skills. So we're concerned um, that while we completely agree with the need, uh, we would just have to find a way to ensure that uh, we wouldn't see too much staff uh, transitioning away uh, given these new requirements and instead we could really focus on supplementing the bill with uh, professional development and technical assistance as well as uh, the funds that providers would need to retain these staff and really achieve the goals that, I, that we very much see this bill sets out to do. I want to thank you all. I want to thank you all um, for a, a very good um, hearing and um, I really like the fact that you made it very clear what 
um, the recommendations <laughs> should be going forward. Um, thank you. Nancy, thank you for your thank testimony. You. And if there's anything that we can do um, to be of assistance, please um, be in touch. And um, I just have one, um, one uh, for the record, the New York, um, the YMCA of Greater New York has submitted testimony um, for this oversight hearing that will be entered. Um, and with that, I'd like to thank you all again, and this meeting is adjourned. Thank, thank you so you. much. What time? Uh, 12.30. No, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, one o'clock.